I guess we got to get going. All right, let's get going this morning uh, for our Grand Rounds talk. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, for me to introduce Dr. Megan Lautner, an assistant professor in the Division of Surgical Oncology and uh, Endocrine Surgery. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lautner grew up in M M Michigan, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was just the it was just the state on the other side of Lake Michigan when you grew up in Chicago, and then it became a bad word when you go to Ohio State, uh -huh. uh, the Ohio State. Yes, right? the. Um, and uh, she did her uh, medical school at Wayne State, uh, and then uh, her residency here, and uh, she did her breast fellowship, which I forgot to ask you, at MD Anderson. And this morning she's going to talk about uh, breast surgery, whether more is better than less. less. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Schroeder. Okay. All right. So this morning I'm just going to do a little bit of review of some of the literature, some of it recent, some of it historical, over what has really shaped our practice of breast cancer surgery today. Um, and uh, talk a little bit about that and then some of the more um, minimally invasive, I guess you could say, procedures that we have. So it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I have no financial disclosure, sadly. Um, breast cancer surgery today is really oriented, as it always has been, between the breast and, and the axilla. And some of the procedures that we use for the breast today include um, the historical standard of care, which was a radical mastectomy. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the other uh, mastectomies that are, that are more often used today are modified radical and total mastectomy. There's two subsets of total mastectomy, which includes removing all the breast tissue that are more cosmetically oriented and used in the patients that are going to undergo reconstruction, reconstruction and those are skin sparing mastectomy and nipple sparing mastectomy. And then, of course, we have the more um, the less invasive procedure, which is a partial mastectomy, also known as lumpectomy, also known as segmentectomy, also known uh, as quadrantectomy. And then we have to discuss, of course, the staging and, and or the treatment or clearance of the axilla, and we do that with uh, two different operations, axillary lymph node dissection, which is historically what has been used for the axilla, and then now probably more common, which would be sentinel lymph node biopsy, and we'll talk a little bit about how that procedure has come about. So historically, back in the 1890s, was uh, the Halstead radical mastectomy was, was really the um, treatment of choice for breast cancer, and that existed for about 70 years. And this came about after uh, really more barbaric and um, essentially fatal procedures, which were basically a guillotine mastectomy where the breast was just lopped off with a, a sharp knife, um, and the patient was then bound to hopefully stop the bleeding, but they usually either died from exsanguination or, or infection. Uh, and then in the 1890s, Halstead uh, developed this technique, which is removing um, the breast, obviously, all the breast tissue, the pec major, sometimes the pec minor, and then level one through three lymph nodes, which included the long thoracic and the thoracodorsal nerves that run through the axilla. So as you can see in the picture there, it was very, very morbid procedure, um, cosmetically uh, not pleasing at all. Um, but it's what was used for 70 years to hopefully um, try to cure these patients. Um, in the 1970s, the NSABP started uh, the BO4 trial, which looked at the survival of these patients who underwent a radical mastectomy versus either a total mastectomy or essentially a modified radical mastectomy because the radical mastectomy was so morbid, um, had a lot of complications, and they noticed the patients didn't really seem to live that long anyway. And so this is a little bit busy um, of a figure, but essentially is the gist of the study, which was a randomized controlled trial. And what they found is that the there was no difference in survival between the radical mastectomy patients and those that underwent either total mastectomy with radiation or essentially a modified radical mastectomy. And that really shifted the paradigm to modified radical mastectomies being the treatment of choice for breast cancer um, in the 1970s. And so just to review, uh, even though the students aren't here, a modified radical mastectomy does in, uh, encompass a total mastectomy, so you remove all the breast tissue, and it includes a axillary lymph node dissection, which is now just level one and two. We typically don't remove level three on a uh, regular basis. Um, it's removed on block, and then you have to remove enough skin for a flat chest closure if the patient's not going to undergo reconstruction. So the patient can have reconstruction with a modified radical mastectomy, um, but you just have to keep in mind that you have enough skin if they're going to have a, a tissue expander placed or something like that. And again, it came about and is used because its survival is equal to that of radical mastectomy with obviously removing a lot less tissue and a lot less morbid procedure. 
So the, the main component, obviously, of a modified radical mastectomy is the total mastectomy. So it's removing all the breast tissue. It, it's really just total mastectomy really just means removing the breast tissue. It doesn't take into account any type of reconstruction, doesn't take into account um, assessment of the lymph nodes or treatment of the lymph nodes. And so you can see in the pictures, it's the, the chest wall is left flat. It's usually a linear scar. Um, and it usually is combined with uh, some sort of a lymph node procedure. So we'll just kind of review quickly the other um, cosmetically oriented types of total mastectomy. So skin sparing mastectomy came about in like I think the late 1980s, 1990s, and it essentially it, it essentially is just removing all of the breast tissue, but through a smaller incision. And it was really driven by the plastic surgeons who wanted to find a better way to offer these women reconstruction. And so you preserve the entire skin envelope and still remove all the breast tissue. And the reason for doing this is you then preserve the patient's normal contour of their breast. So people that have really droopy or totic breasts, they were, allowed, they were able to preserve their contour and give them a better reconstruction option. And so um, it was found to be oncologic sa oncologically safe, and we use it today in patients that are going to undergo reconstruction. There really isn't any role for doing a skin sparing if they're not going to have reconstruction because you're just going to leave a bunch of skin there that's going to get wrinkly um, and scar down to the chest wall and it makes it difficult for the patient to wear a prosthesis because it can't sit flat against the chest wall. So it's typically always combined with reconstruction um, and the different incisions are on your left, the first two being of course a periareolar incision um, and then the third one there a lollipop and the, the last one a lateral position. I think probably the first two are the most commonly used. So you can imagine there's some risk with it. You're removing all of the breast tissue through a small hole. Um, as a lot of you know, we tell the patients they get the, the skin over the breast gets most of its blood supply from the breast itself. And so when you are removing and scooping the breast out there, they, of course, can get flat necrosis or have damage to their skin, which is sort of counterintuitive to the procedure because you're trying to provide them a good cosmetic outcome. Along those lines are the, the ever popular nipple, nipple sparing mastectomy, and that's essentially you're preserving, preserving the entire skin envelope as well as the nipple areola complex. This provides, of course, the optimal cosmetic outcome because it's all of the patient's tissue. You can hide the incisions pretty well, as you can see here, um, both with an uh, inframammary incision or with a rat lateral radial incision, um, and you essentially have to go scoop out all the breast tissue, including the nipple areola complex. It's a controversial procedure because the oncologic safety of it is unknown. Um, there's a recent trial that came out of Europe with just a few patients, like 60, and they think it's, they, according to their study, they're saying it's safe. They're not having a lot of recurrence rates. Um, but you have to remember that uh, it's also fraught with complications because now you have a huge flap. So you're expecting all of this skin, all this skin to get its blood supply from up here because you've disrupted it from down here. And so it's a technically challenging procedure requires a lot of retraction. It actually elicits a lot of trauma to the skin, um, but it is an option in certain patient populations. There's a lot of um, uh, institutions that have their own in indications, inclusion and exclusion criteria, and these are some of the most common. So as you can imagine, it has to be a small tumor. You can't be working in a small hole with a big bulky tumor. Um, you can't have any skin involvement because you need to leave all the skin intact and that blood supply has to come from medially all the way to laterally. Uh, the tumors typically, most institutions want them located more than two centimeters from the nipple areola complex in order to get a good cancer operation. You have to have a clinically negative axilla so that they have a low chance of having to undergo post-mastectomy radiation because um, obviously these patients are going to undergo immediate reconstruction and the nipple uh, and the rest of the skin isn't going to hold up well with, if they need to undergo post-mastectomy radiation. You need to set yourself up for success, so you have to select the patients that aren't smokers, that don't have a lot of connective tissue or vascular uh, disease so that they ensure that they have uh, good, good blood supply and good perfusion. Um, they can't have had a prior history of either breast radiation or chest wall radiation uh, for whatever reason. And then obviously you want someone that has a lower BMI and a smaller breast because you can imagine trying to get all the breast tissue from here and someone who has a double D-sized breast would be quite challenging and difficult. So there is a role for it in some patients, um, but there's a lot of things to, to consider, and the patients need to be counseled extensively about the risks um, of not only skin necrosis but nipple necrosis. So is more really better? Should we should we be doing you know more? Should we do, be doing mastectomies on everyone? Should we be removing these breasts? Um, 
And is there any other way that we can we can adequately treat the breast cancer? So in the 1970s, shortly after they started occurring for the B04 trial, they also started occurring for the B06. And that was uh, designed to evaluate the efficacy of breast conserving surgery, so lumpectomy, so not a mastectomy, lumpectomy, partial mastectomy, segmental mastectomy, whatever you want to call it. And women with stage 1 or stage 2 breast tumors, so smaller tumors that were 4 centimeters or less, and what they looked at was the outcome of lumpectomy alone or lumpectomy combined with whole breast radiation compared to mastectomy. And the caveats to the trial were they had to have a negative margin. And then this was still back in the time when everybody underwent an axillary lymph node dissection. So that was how they evaluated the axilla. And the couple um, significant results from this trial were, of course, recurrence. So this is how come we can offer patients breast conserving therapy, which is lumpectomy combined with radiation, um, today. And you can see here that the patients that, this is 20 years out, the patients that underwent a lumpectomy only had a recurrence rate of about 40%. And those who underwent lumpectomy plus radiation, their recurrence rate is down here somewhere around 13%. So there's a big statistically, statistically significant difference if you add that radiation with lumpectomy, which is why the patients have to undergo radiation when they have breast conserving therapy now. The other component of this, of this trial that allows us to offer breast conserving therapy um, and mastectomy in most patients is that the disease-free survival, the distance disease disease-free survival, and most importantly, overall survival are equivalent. There's no statistically significant difference between survival in patients who had a mastectomy and patients who had lumpectomy. Now, this is interesting because it, it does also show that the patients that had a lumpectomy had a, a similar survival, but the reason we combine it with radiation is to give them a uh, much lower recurrence rate. So is more really better? And in the 1970s and when BO6 was published, the answer to that is no. So a lumpectomy with radiation was found to be as effective as a total mastectomy in the treatment of small, so less than 4, less than 5 centimeter breast cancers. There was no difference in disease-free survival, distant disease-free survival, or overall survival. And so following this, it prompted the NIH to release a consensus statement in the 1990s, which stated that breast conserving therapy, so again, that's lumpectomy combined with radiation, you have to have the radiation component, is an appropriate method of primary therapy for women with stage 1 and stage 2 breast cancer, and is preferable because it provides survival rates equivalent to those of total mastectomy while still preserving the breast. And so this really opened the doors for women who had breast cancer and, and is in regards to their surgical options and their cosmetic outcome. And um, some of the, the rules, though, if you're going to offer someone a partial mastectomy or a lumpectomy, is that you have to get negative margins. That's why the recurrence rates were so low, and that's why survival was as good, is because we got negative margins with these patients. They have to be able to undergo radiation therapy. Well, that would seem like mostly everybody, but you have to remember the patients that had mantle, mantle radiation for childhood tumors, they may have read radiotherapy for thyroid cancer. Um, they may have connective tissue disease, scleroderma, things like that. And so those patients that can't have radiation then need to undergo mastectomy. And you have to be able to detect a local recurrence. So part of the reason why survival is this good is because if we find something, we typically find it early and it's still treatable. So they have to be willing, if they have a breast intact, to undergo a mammogram and undergo their, um, their exams. And so during fellowship, we, we decided to look at why if, mes if lumpectomy or breast conserving therapy is just as good as mastectomy, why are we still doing so many mastectomies? And there's a discrepancy in the literature if you look at single institution studies versus um, nationwide studies such as the SEER database. Single institution studies say mastectomy rates are going up. You look at it in the SEER database, they say mastectomy rates might be going down. So we decided to look at an even bigger database, which is a national cancer database. It's a joint program of the Commission on Cancer, American College of Surgeons, and the American Cancer Society. And it's a nationwide oncology outcomes database, and it captures around 70% of new cancer cases. We looked at patients diagnosed from 1998 to 2011, which encompassed about 700,000 patients. There's a couple million in the database. And these are patients who had clinical T1 or T2, so tumors less than 5 centimeters in size, any end disease, and they had to have undergone breast conservation therapy, so again, lumpectomy followed by radiation or mastectomy. And so what we found was that after the NIH released their consensus statement in the 1990s, there was, of course, an increase in breast conserving therapy and a decrease in mastectomy because it kind of became all the rage. 
But then about 20, 2006, everything leveled out. So we said at about 60% of patients un, undergoing breast conserving therapy and 40% undergoing mastectomy. So that's still a lot of mastectomies. And, and if you take patients like we did who have essentially the same size breast cancer, what is driving their decision? And interesting, what we found is most of these factors are socioeconomic. They have nothing to do with the, with cancer itself or with the, the tumor biology or um, the, the size or stage of the tumor. And so we did a multivariate analysis. The factors that, that remained significant were year of diagnosis, age, insurance type, median income, education level, facility type, geographic location, and patient travel distance. And so we investigated these things a little bit further, and what we found is if you look at the patients um, over, the time, over the study period, so from 1998 to 2011, and you broke it down based on these factors, this graph is a little bit busy, but what you need to focus on is noticing that the patients who had private insurance were the highest proportion of patients that had breast conserving therapy over the study period. And it was much higher and statistically significantly higher than those who had uh, Medicaid or, or public insurance um, as well as other government insurance. Similarly, when you looked at the travel distance from the treatment facility, so where the patient lived in relation to where they were getting treatment, those that lived further from the treatment facility, so greater than 17.3 miles, were less likely to get breast conserving therapy and more likely to get a mastectomy. So I keep mentioning that breast conserving therapy is a lumpectomy combined with radiation, and most of you know that that radiation therapy has to happen every day for somewhere between three and six weeks for five days a week. And so if you live really far from a radiation facility, it makes sense that you might not opt for that, especially if you're working, you have children to care for, and things like that. And so this was a, this was a predictor for breast conserving therapy if the patient lived more than 17 miles from their treatment facility. When we looked at income, patients, which goes along with insurance, patients who made more than $46,000 a year are more likely to have breast conserving therapy than mastectomy. Um, and you can see those that were less than $30,000 were, um, were much more likely to undergo a mastectomy, though there was some improvement over time. So we concluded from our study that we made significant gains. So we're not seeing discrepancies anymore based on, on treatment facility, which was very prevalent back in the 1990s, um, meaning that most of the breast conserving therapy was only done in academic centers. Um, and we've, we've gotten better in some regards, but we still have a lot of barriers, and the two that seem to be most significant are travel distance and socioeconomic factors, so income and insurance. And they appear to be barriers for patients to getting breast conserving therapy. So again, I remind you that these patients have the same size tumors, so they could undergo either, and it seems to be that these factors are what's driving their decision. So that's the breast. We talk about what, what have we done to downsize the amount of breast surgery. What about the lymph nodes? What advances have we made for that? So the standard of care for lymph node um, treatment for breast cancer for years was axillary lymph node dissection. It's removal, as we all know, of level 1 and level 2 lymph nodes. It provides regional control, and it's still indicated today in a clinically positive axilla. Um, however, it is not without complications and morbidity. So there's about a 20% risk of lymphedema for all patients who undergo an axillary lymph node dissection. It's quite morbid. Um, it can really disrupt their, their everyday life, um, and it is a real complication. In addition, there's nerve injury to the thoracodorsal or the long thoracic nerves that run uh, that run through the axilla. And then, of course, the residents have probably seen a lot of patients that have chronically draining seromas. They need frequent aspirations or frequent drainage, um, and it can, be, uh, it can be very morbid as well. And so eventually we adopted the sentinel lymph node biopsy that was originally developed in melanoma, and it is a, um, a method of, of staging the axilla through a minimally invasive approach. It uses a combination of a radio tracer and blue dye. The radio tracer, of course, correlates with the probe that we use in the operating room. It's a very accurate technique as long as you, it's done correctly, and it has a relatively low risk of complications. And in the picture you see here, you see the tumor located here, and it's showing you the lymphatic channels. The blue dye is injected either periareolar uh, or around the tumor itself. The isotope is injected prior to the operating room. And then as the residents all know, it looks exactly like this once you are looking for the sentinel lymph node in the OR. So in the 1990s, the NSABP did another trial trying to figure out if we can downsize the amount of axillary surgery that, that is done. And they randomized women with invasive carcinoma who had a clinically negative axilla, so they don't have palpable nodes, to either a sentinel lymph node biopsy followed by axillary lymph node dissection, regardless of what the sentinel lymph node biopsy showed, or a sentinel lymph node biopsy alone. 
And again, the results are pretty striking. So they, again, the, these graphs, I know they're hard to see because they're small, but essentially you just need to focus on the fact that these two lines was so the red is senten sentinel lymph node biopsy and axillary dissection. The blue, is, or the bottom dotted one, is uh, sentinel lymph node biopsy alone. Same over here. And there's no difference in overall survival or disease-free survival for the sentinel lymph node negative patients. So if a patient has a sentinel lymph node biopsy and it's negative, there's no difference in overall survival or disease-free survival compared to if you took the same patient and just dissected them just because. So in a clinically, clinically negative axilla, the NSABP determined in this trial that a sentinel lymph node biopsy is appropriate. An axillary lymph node dissection should only be reserved for patients with clinically positive nodes or patients who have a positive sentinel lymph node biopsy. They're going to get mo the most benefit from, this, from the procedure. So then we move forward to about 2011, or actually the late, uh, the late 1990s, early 2000s, and we've decided now that we're going to try and determine how positive is positive when you talk about a positive sentinel lymph node. And the uh, American College of Surgeons Oncology Group, the Z11 trial is very popular, came out in 2011, and it was designed to determine the effects of axillary lymph node dissection on overall survival in patients with the sentinel lymph node that are treated in the contemporary era. So back in B32, we didn't have as good as systemic therapies, we didn't have hormonal therapies um, and things that we have now. So if you take a patient who's treated now, who gets a lumpectomy, who's going to get chemotherapy or endocrine therapy or chemotherapy and endocrine therapy, as well as whole breast radiation, then do we really need to keep doing all these axillary lymph node dissections? And so they included patients who with invasive carcinoma, tumors again less than 5 centimeters, so T, T1 or T2, um, who are treated with a lumpectomy only, and they had a clinical negative axilla, so no palpable nodes, and they had a positive sentinel lymph node, but it was, had to be less than 3. So anybody that had more than 3 positive sentinel lymph nodes was excluded, and they were not allowed to have gotten any neoadjuvant uh, chemotherapy or endocrine therapy. Most of the patients in the study, and this is one of the criticisms, were postmenopausal, and most of them had tumors that were ER positive, so they were going to get some sort of adjuvant, adjuvant endocrine therapy. And what they found was that there was no difference, again, in survival between the patients that under, underwent a sentinel lymph node biopsy alone and had less than three negative nodes, or a sentinel lymph node biopsy with three negative nodes followed by axillary clearance. The axillary recurrence rate for someone who had less than three positive sentinel lymph nodes at five years was found to be 0.9%. So they concluded that women with, with T1 or T2 tumors with a positive sentinel lymph node undergoing whole breast radiation and systemic treatment, so chemotherapy and or endocrine therapy, can avoid axillary lymph node dissection. There's a lot of criticism of this study for several reasons, and the, the, primary, the primary one is that it didn't reach accrual in that they um, were only open for about five years. But the reason, one of the reasons it didn't reach accrual was the fact that the mortality, they were looking at survival, they were looking at mortality from axillary recurrence. And it was so low that they predicted it was going to take them roughly around 20 years to, to um, get enough patients and find enough results that, that, that it was going to be valid. So they closed the study early after about five years of accrual, uh, and this is what they found from that five years. Similarly, the um, International Breast Cancer Study Group released the 2301 trial, and it was essentially the same. The main difference here is that these patients could have undergone a mastectomy or a lumpectomy, and that 99% of their patients in the study also received radiation and or some form of systemic therapy. They also didn't look at as much nodal disease. They only looked at patients that had micrometastasis, which is defined as less than two millimeters of metastatic disease in the, in the sentinel lymph node. So they're looking at a much lower burden of sentinel lymph node disease, but essentially their results were the same. There's no difference in survival if you take someone who has a, a smaller, less than two millimeter focus of metastatic disease in the sentinel lymph node, whether you dissect their axilla or not, there's no difference in survival. So they advocate for avoiding that morbidity in these patients. So you can't really talk too much about um, minimally invasive breast surgery without sort of going to the other extreme, which is contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. And so this is defined as a removal of unaffected breast. And so for all of us that have had, been in breast clinic, the patients come in with a small breast cancer and they say, I want them both removed, I want to live, I take them off to save my life, this is what we need to do. Well, the interesting thing about contralateral prophylactic mastectomy 
prophylactic mastectomy is for that reason, the rates are increasing, awareness is increasing. Angelina Jolie is pictured here. She, of course, didn't have breast cancer. She only tested positive for uh, the BRCA mutation. Um, but she's very public about her diagnosis and very public about her decision, um, as are many people, uh, many celebrities. And so the awareness is increasing. More people are getting genetic testing. Um, and then the other component of this is that our reconstruction options are improving. And so you saw the pictures of the nipple sparing mastectomies and the skin sparing mastectomies. And these patients know about this and they've seen results or known someone and seen their results. And so they come in sort of with this preconceived notion that they need to remove both of their breasts to save their lives. So more should be better in this circumstance, and that's what the patients think, but it depends on what your definition of better is. Throughout the years, there's been several studies that show that contralateral prophylactic mastectomy, so removing an unaffected breast, does not improve survival. So these women don't live longer if you take off their unaffected breast. And they're usually a little bit shocked to hear this, and it's been studied over and over again. And in fact, they recently released a meta-analysis saying advising against it because the risk the morbidity risk with the removing an unaffected breast is indeed higher than the average woman's average risk of developing a breast cancer in that side. And so we have to spend a lot of time with the patients explaining this, that it's not going to make them live longer if they take off a breast that doesn't have cancer in it. Now, the difference here is that the patients that have the BRCA1 or 2 mutation, those are the only patients that benefit from undergoing a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy. So that's the only time that a contralateral prophylactic mastectomy is indicated is if the patient has a, or, con, or prophylactic mastectomy for that matter, is indicated as if the patient does test positive for a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. There's no other patient population that's going to receive as much benefit, and it shouldn't be recommended in those patients. So why is more not better? Why, why? It doesn't make sense. If we can take off all these breasts and we can, then maybe we should, and it's going to make these patients live longer. Well, as we all know, more surgery equals more risk for complications. And the interesting thing about breast cancer is that our systemic treatments have gotten so good and become so advanced that they actually also treat the unaffected breast. So I tend to tell the patients that you may have a small breast cancer on one side, but everything we do aside from surgery and radiation is going to treat the other side as well. Um, and this includes chemotherapy depending on, on the stage of their disease and, and their uh, receptors, as well as endocrine therapy. And endocrine therapy lasts for five years, and that protects both sides. So we've gotten a lot better. Uh, with not only our systemic treatment, but also with improved screening and surveillance. So typically once the patients are diagnosed with breast cancer, we see them quite frequently um, every four months or so for the next five years, uh, in addition to at least yearly thereafter, if not more often. And um, we found that there's no survival benefit with removing an unaffected breast because of early detection and then our improved systemic treatment. In summary, we have an increased understanding of tumor biology that's led to less radical procedures for breast cancer. Our survival, we found that survival is equal between breast conservation therapy and mastectomy, and so patients with adequately sized tumors and adequately sized breasts should be offered both methods of treatment and explained that they are equal. Patient preference of surgical treatment, so what they want as a cosmetic outcome, should always be considered and factored into the uh, surgical planning. Axillary lymph node dissection may be avoidable in certain subsets of patients with a small burden of disease. And contralateral prophylactic mastectomy does not improve survival for the average risk patient, however, is indicated in patients who have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. And I'll take any questions. If anybody likes hockey, Saturday night, Pink in the Rink is being sponsored by the CTRC, and I think there's still tickets available, um, but it's supposed to be a fun game. So, Thank you. So which is more prevalent, breast cancer or lung cancer? Breast cancer. I didn't push it hard enough. And if you make it 20 years, mm -hmm. you consider it a cure? Or is there never, do you ever say that to a woman? Disease-free. Disease-free. <laughs> no evidence of disease. There's a hedge. Yeah. Going into radiology. Those are words that we like. Dr. Cruz, you find somebody at 20 years, are they cured? With no uh, evidence that was very nice, uh, Dr. Lautner. Thank you. Well presented. Uh, I'd just like to mention that uh, this institution, institution played a significant role in the uh, early days of um, trying to devise 
better ways of treating breast cancer, namely BO4. We were one of the top contributors to that and followed also by BO6 and uh, BO5. And um, I think what uh, Megan has uh, stressed is that really you, ha you don't have to, to be as radical as we used to be and you could obtain the same results, if not better results, with lesser and uh, more intelligent approach to uh, the problem. And I think that uh, our uh, chief uh, source of, uh, of uh, uh, appreciation for this is really the fact that we were caught early on doing this thing. And I remember when we first started uh, uh, doing this procedure lesser, we re really found out that there were a whole bunch of surgeons who really didn't want to give up their radical mastectomy. And that, that was really quite interesting. Dr. Jatoy or Dr. Oliver, any comments? Dr. Abergili. Thank you. Right, so I think that was kind of actually one of the things that the, the VO6 showed was that the lumpectomy alone patients did survival-wise equivalent to mastectomy. Our systemic treatments have changed a little bit, but the key with, the, with lumpectomy alone versus lumpectomy plus radiation is recurrence. So the recurrence rates are significantly higher if you don't radiate the breast, and that's what's developed in us wanting to, to proceed with that. Just to answer uh, your question, I mean, so his was DCIS, uh, you know, the, the study by Silverstein and Lyles, it wasn't invasive cancer. It wasn't a randomized trial. And basically the laboratory setup at, uh, at, at, uh, in California, at Santa Monica, where he did it, was totally different. And so people have argued you can't really apply that, those results, but it was, it was based on DCIS and okay. not invasive cancer. Dr. Pastana. Two minor historical little things. Okay. It was not this institution that changed the way things were done in San Antonio. It was Dr. Cruz himself. Okay. He was the <laughs> one who did that. And the other little historical reference is that the interest in lesser in surgery was started sort of accidentally by the needs during World War II. <clears throat> All the surgeons who had the expertise to do the radical mastectomy had been drafted. They were all in the army. And all the women who had breast cancer during the years of World War II had to go to a general practitioner. And the general practitioner was only capable technically of doing a simple mastectomy. Mm -hmm. And everybody said, oh, those poor women, they're all going to die. Well, they, they didn't. didn't. <laughs> so as the years went on afterwards, the seed was planted. Maybe Holstead wasn't really right all along. That's very cool. So the corollary is we should find out who's doing radical mastectomies and draft them and <laughs> send them someplace. <laughs> Dr. Stewart. So really nice presentation, Megan. Uh, you, you know, I guess the dilemma is the, is the what to do with your Sentinel node now with, mm -hmm. with those two trials you presented. And Dr. Choi's also presented these trials. Uh, and, and you, so I guess the question, so, so is, well, what, what are you recommending for women? So I'm going to have three questions. First, what do you recommend for women currently with respect to that? The second is you alluded to BRCA1 and 2 mm -hmm. potentially benefiting from bilateral mastectomy. So who should be screened? Who is being screened? Those are the first two mm -hmm. questions. Okay, so the first, for first question about sentinel lymph nodes, what do I do? So at MD Anderson, obviously, they were, the majority of the authors on Z11 were from MD Anderson or trained the people there at the MD Anderson. So we, we used it there in fellowship exclusively. So anybody that was going to get a lumpectomy, 
that had a, a relatively small tumor who didn't get chemo beforehand, they sort of met Z11 criteria and were be, would be treated as such. Um, it's not as widely accepted everywhere. So, so, so as such means if your sentinel lymph node is negative, obviously you don't get an X-ray right. node dissection. If your sentinel lymph node is positive, and then you're going to get systemic therapy, so right. therefore you don't do it. Right. So the way the way that it, we would do it, the way that it was done over there. So if you were, for example, a postmenopausal woman, you had like a one centimeter breast cancer, you yeah. wanted a lumpectomy. It was ER positive, so you were going to get endocrine therapy. You're going to get whole breast radiation. Um, then they would send the sentinel, do the sentinel lymph node as long as there were less than three positive. So less than three sentinel lymph nodes were positive, then they would not do an X-ray lymph node dissection. If they found more than three nodes positive on the sentinel lymph node. Um, then they would go back and do a completion axillary lymph node dissection. So the other criticism of that is that the radi radiation oncologists weren't blinded during that study. So they knew that the patients had one or two sentinel lymph nodes positive. They might have been giving the axilla a little bit of radiation. And so... Data that they did. Yes, and so it's a little bit controversial. Uh, and then your second question about the BRCA1 or 2. So there's NC NCCN guidelines for who should be screened, and they're very extensive. But I think pretty much what raises red flags, so any woman diagnosed under the age of 45, um, anybody that has a lot of first-degree relatives, so moms, sisters with breast or ovarian cancer, um, anybody that has a significant family history of, like, grandmothers, even great aunts, aunts that had breast or ovarian cancer at young ages, so 30s or 40s, and, and died from the same. Um, any male, obviously, should be tested. Uh, so those are kind of some of the basic criteria that we use. When you get into more extensive family histories and looking at stomach, prostate, pancreas cancer, they, they can also contribute. But you're basically your young women with breast cancer. Is it ones. expensive? Is that one of the... It is. If you're going to pay flat out out of pocket at several thousand dollars. I don't. Do you know, Dr. Gisela? Four thousand Four thousand. Dr. Gaskell. I, my comment is along the lines of Dr. Pastana. I joined Surgery C when I first came on the faculty. And at that time, Bill McGuire had been recruited by the medicine department, and he's He's kind of the inventor of the estrogen receptor, and it, it was his plan to come down to San Antonio and be the king of breast cancer and send the patients down to the surgeons with a work order of what we should do. And he didn't count on Dr. Cruz. Surgery C had the breast clinic, and we were the primary care doctors for every breast in the county and all the way down to the valley. And Surgery C was very took very good care of their patients. Any patient who came into the emergency room on Surgery C would be admitted to Surgery C. These were before the days of the close oversight of admissions. And the nurses would go through the charts, even if they came in with a nosebleed, and say, oh, they were seen in Surgery C. Call a Surgery C intern to admit them. We would have 40 patients on the service. We, surgery C gave all the chemotherapy to the patients. And I think most people don't realize that while the whole medical oncology department, Bill McGuire and everybody else, would have dozens of patients on NIH protocols, Dr. Cruz had hundreds of patients on NIH protocols. So it was really an amazing time to learn about breast surgery. And this guy is the most technically precise surgeon I have ever operated with. It's amazing. Thank you. And final follow-up question. You didn't, you didn't mention it, but I'm just... So, and those who still, I think, believe in, in following with uh, X-ray node dissection with positive single lymph node, what about the concept of reverse mapping? So, map the arm with a different color and then map your sentinel node. So, there you know, essentially, picking which uh, channels to not sacrifice. So, yeah, so Dr. Klimberg is the one I think that's probably talked the most about that from Arkansas. Um, I've never tried it, never seen it done. It seems to make sense, but I think ultimately it ends up being more technically challenging, right, than, than, than it's worth, essentially. The thing is, with, if you do the cell lymph node, the morbidity is so low. Yeah. And you know, she's proposed a trial with the NSABP to look at that question. But the number of patients required, because the events are so low, would be five, 6,000. So people have really kind of dismissed that as a way of, as an option that can be tested in a randomized trial. Mohammed. 
Uh -huh. First question is in regard to radiation of the axilla uh -huh. in regards to the number of causes lymph nodes uh -huh. to be like one. Now it used to be like more than four lymph nodes uh -huh. to be in. Now in the last article, we want to three also. We'll Consider. So whether we need to do the axillary dissection if everybody will get the, the radiation. And my second question is technical in regards to I'm trying to do the thermal lymph node and I cannot get. Uh -huh. So, to start with your first question, so yeah, the indication. Is that on the app site? <laughs> <laughs> I doubt any. I doubt any of it. Was it? Highly suspicious. Then for the app site, the answer is yes. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> yes. The app site, the answer is yes, and on your board, the answer would be yes. You proceed with an axillary lymph node dissection. Um, if it's my patient, it's probably going to depend on a lot of different factors. And so, uh, to start with your last question, so yeah, the standard of care is if you can't find the sentinel lymph node, then you should proceed with an axillary lymph node dissection. Um, and uh, uh, I think in most patients, that's probably the right answer. Now, if you have a patient who's postmenopausal who has a three millimeter area of calcification that's invasive ductal carcinoma with a proliferation index of three, uh, who's ER positive. Um, then, you know, it, it may, you could probably say, well, we'll put you in Z11, so we wouldn't actually dissect you anyway, even if we found a couple, and you could kind of play the what-if game there and talk to the patient about it. Um, but most patients still need to have their axilla cleared because you don't have an idea of their stage um, if you don't. In regards to radiating the axilla, so um, the previous indications used to be a significantly higher number of lymph nodes, and now there's some discussion if they're one to three. And I think Dr. Crownover's preference is to kind of talk to the patient. So if they have one to one to three, uh, I'm sorry, two to three lymph nodes positive on, from their axilla, then he'll kind of talk to them and discuss whether or not they would benefit from radiotherapy to the axilla. Um, and that's the problem with Z11 is we don't know how many of those patients got radiation, and we don't know if that's what we should be doing. Now, Amaro's trial just came out, and it's still really not much clearer because there's a lot of discrepancy between which patients they used it on, which patients they didn't. And so it's, it definitely may be an option for, um, for patients to avoid the morbidity of undergoing axillary lymph node dissection surgically where we can radiate those patients and they'll have less complications. We just have to make sure that their survival and recurrence is as, as good. What is the morbidity, I should know, what's the morbidity of, ex, of irradiating the axilla? Is, is there lymphedema? They can, still get, lymph lymphedema they can still get lymphedema, and the lymphedema is the actual the number that was, so t for surgeries, 20% of the time they can get lymphedema. For radiation, it's less than that. I don't know the exact number, but it's significantly less. But then they also, they also count shoulder difficulties with movement and, and restrictions, and those aren't really any better with radiation versus surgery, but the lymphedema is a little bit better. Oh, that's true. Mm -hmm. Like all things in surgery, it's 100% that have to be used. And Dr. Santiago and I both have had that reaction. Mm -hmm. And it's a pretty serious deal. It makes it pretty jumpy. And so now I give my patients Benadryl or steroids and Pepsi prior to using that. It only gives two, two, two. Dr. Hurd? Where do we stand here? I think that uh, in general, I think we're still we're still proceeding with standard of care, which is if they have a sentinel lymph node po positive, to go with actually lymph node dissection. We do um, obviously don't count uh, uh, isolated tumor cells and micrometastasis don't qualify for that. Um, but essentially, if they have a positive node, then we're proceeding with axillary clearance. Yes, Dr. Bunny. Uh -huh. Is there no for lobular carcinoma in sight? You, you mentioned only breast cancer. What about lobular uh, cancer? So LCIS is really just a marker for increased breast cancer risk, and, and you you excise it. So if someone comes to back up, if someone comes in with calcifications or whatever, and mammogram gets a biopsy, it's LCIS. Um, we excise that to make sure that there's nothing else hiding with it, so DCIS or invasive disease, either invasive lobular or invasive ductal. 
And, else, and that's why we excise it. We don't have to excise it to negative margins because it's just a marker. You're not treating the LCIS. You need to sort of treat both breasts. And so if someone has LCIS, they need to obviously adhere to normal screening rules, but consider more intense screening and also even consider chemo prevention with something like tamoxifen. Um, there's no indication that they're going to get a significant risk reduction in developing breast cancer that's going to contribute to a decrease in survival by doing prophylactic mastectomies. So there is some sort of thought, well, if they have lobular, either lobular carcinoma or LCIS, oh, they need to have both breasts removed because it can come back anywhere. Well, that's true, but it doesn't necessarily correlate to a decreased survival. But is it an option that I can give to the you, you can. I think if I was the patient, I'd rather take tamoxifen than have bilateral mastectomies, and so you have to make sure you consider all of that. But if they have a really high anxiety level, then, then in insurance will cover it. You could try. <laughs> See? So, right. So you bring up a good point. So the way that Z11 was handled at MD Anderson was the patient were the patients who would qualify to have the study applied to them. So the patients that were getting a lumpectomy for a small tumor, um, typically postmenopausal, you are positive, though they they stretch that to some other patients. What they would do is send those sentinel lymph nodes for permanent just like in DCIS, send them for permanent so that you're not faced with that decision intraoperatively because you want to know what the full extent of the burden of disease is in the sentinel lymph nodes. So they would send them for permanent, and then when that PATH report comes back, you can look at it and see how many of your sentinel lymph nodes are positive and how much disease. And so if you have, you know, three millimeters of disease in four nodes altogether, then you can kind of discuss with the patient. You have to include your multidisciplinary team with MedOnc and Radonc what's going to serve them best. And so that helps to eliminate that sort of decision-making process in the operating room is they would send them for permanent, wake the patient up, and then when they came back to the office, go over the PATH report, and then ultimately decide what to do. And they would always do it as a team approach. So if the radiation oncologist thought it was a small enough amount of disease, they could treat with, with uh, low axillary tangents than they would, um, or if they thought it was best, you know, if it's a lot of disease, bulky, extra capsular invasion, lymphovascular invasion, then you might want to consider surgical clearance. Radiation is not a substitute for bad surgery. That's what they said. Yes. So do you want to answer that, Dr. Joshua? You were just talking about the other day. So, so the IORT, so there, there's, a, there's a target trial that was uh, reported on, I guess, about uh, three years ago. Initially, there was some, some enthusiasm because the survival curves were uh, identical. Now with the follow-up, we're seeing that patients who get intraoperative radiotherapy versus whole breast radiation uh, actually are having delayed recurrences. So initially, the, the, the survival curves were very similar. Now with further follow-up, we're seeing a, uh, a, a spreading of that, those curves where the patients who get intraoperative radiotherapy are having high recurrence rates compared to those who got uh, whole breast radiation. So just to clarify, he's an IORT is intraoperative radiotherapy, so what happened is you do the lumpectomy, and then the radiation oncologist would come in and put in a device and sort of treat the lumpectomy bed with one dose of radiation, and that took the place of the three to six weeks of whole breast radiation. And so there was some thought that the um, recurrences always happen in the lumpectomy bed and happen within the first five years, and so that giving that one shot in the OR would alleviate the need for them to keep coming back for several weeks. And now that it's been long enough, like Dr. Detroit said, the data is showing that it's not as good as whole breast radiation. The, the, the same approach, the same general of having a, like a, there's a device, a balloon catheter placed in the cavity yeah. post-op. I think it's yeah, that's partial. So that's, that's so. there's intraoperative radiation, which is actually delivering the radiation with a generator or whatever to the whole lumpectomy bed. And then what you're talking about is uh, partial breast radiation. So it's catheter-based. So you place a catheter in the lumpectomy bed um, in the cavity at the time of resection, and then radiation is delivered through that catheter for a week, for five days, uh, to treat the lumpectomy bed. And it's also, the results aren't as good as whole breast radiation, and it, and it's, it was popular because they said, well, it's having least 
um, less cosmetic defects, so the breast looks better after it. Well, it was only in a certain select patients that you could get enough fat in between the, the catheter and skin, um, and otherwise they had some pretty bad cosmetic defects. And then also, you can plan for it, but if the cavity doesn't, doesn't conform well to the catheter, you're not adequately treating, and so the studies are showing that it's not as good as whole breast radiation either. All right, thank you. Glad to have you back.